If you haven't seen the previous video in this series, follow the link on your screen or click the link in the description or pinned comment below. Forty-eight seconds of logos. Who? Including Sony for cares. Oh! The opening shot of this movie is on a watch, and it's Swiss made, so you know it's good. The time is 6.43 p.m., but then the security camera here says it's 21.05, which according to my math means it's 9.05 p.m. That's a full two hours and 22 minutes off. It's almost like there's been an obvious passage of time. I mean, Jeremy specifically cut out the parts showing Richard has been doing other tasks, which would account for this. Yeah. Be good. Superheroes' parents leave somewhere and die in a Marvel movie cliche. This is the part where I would usually go, this is not a Marvel movie, it's a Sony movie, and leave it at that, but the MCU has made this film a part of its canon. Now, Jeremy doesn't mean it this way, as he calls all these movies Marvel movies in an attempt at watering down the term, but I won't raise this encounter because the stands will pollute my comment section with, actually, it is a Marvel movie because it features the Marvel character. Even though that's not what anyone means by Marvel movie. <laughs> hey, I don't sound like that. How exactly did this assassin kill the pilot in a way that would have also put blood directly on his hands? Later we see that he positioned the pilot so as to keep the plane steady, and maybe doing that put blood on his hands. Why didn't he just put that on autopilot? And if you're telling me that he didn't know how to put the plane on autopilot, why not? That would be so much simpler than positioning a dead dude's arms to steady a plane. Holy gish gallop, Batman. How are all these questions only one sin? Anyway, let's answer them. Your first question about the blood is stupid. We aren't shown how he killed the pilot and that blood could have been his own due to a struggle. And second, if a plane is cruising, it's already in autopilot. Autopilot doesn't prevent a pilot from making adjustments with the yoke. And even if it were in this magical autopilot that controls the plane autonomously, this guy clearly doesn't give a shit because he plans to jump out of it with a chute which is one of the many writing mistakes this film makes, of course. The likelihood of this dude surviving a jump from this plane at this altitude, traveling at this speed, only makes sense in fiction. Man, this assassin guy sure waited a long time to kill the Perkers. If he was sent here for this very reason, to stop them from talking, he nearly done f***ed up. And if the company is one step ahead and has an assassin pilot on board, why even let this plane get off the ground at all? It's cinematic, I suppose, but it makes zero sense. They say you're a genius. Why hasn't he killed the Perkers yet? Why does this guy, who is an assassin, have to monologue? I was willing to let the previous sin go because you had a point about the writing of this movie being pretty bad. But then you went and said the same thing twice, and then you're just yanking my chain. This f***ing plane that is f***ing dive bomb crashing and decompressed with multiple f***ing holes in it does not still have a solid f***ing Wi-Fi signal. Well, why not? Would you care to explain your reasoning for that claim? What does it nosediving and having holes in the cabin have to do with the signal it's receiving from a satellite? You know those satellites are in space, right? Meaning the plane's altitude doesn't even matter and that because the antenna is on the outside of the plane, it would have to have been damaged to interfere with that signal? Heck, most planes use a combination of satellite connections and ground-to-air connections through cell towers, so if anything, his connection should be getting stronger. This movie exists because the other one exists. Now you're just padding the scent count, bro. Allow me to return the favor for sending the greatest opening sequence in any Spider-Man film ever. Also, did he jump out of a plane? This guy is super high above the ground in a free fall, above super high buildings. Jeremy either hasn't been to New York City or has never played the Spider-Man games on PlayStation. Trust me, you old billy goat, there is always a taller building.
hate everything about the CGI in this shot. You rubber neoed Spider-Man. So I'm well known for my distaste for this film. I have a lot of complaints, and that mainly stems from the fact that I am a Spider-Man fanboy. I mean, look at my Twitter and Instagram. That 15 there is literally because of Amazing Fantasy 15, or the debut of Spider-Man in comic books. So believe me when I say... I also want to dunk on this movie, but what we're not going to do is pretend this film doesn't absolutely nail the visual aesthetic of Spider-Man. This sequence alone is one of the best I've ever seen, and this series has the best web swinging in any Spider-Man movie. So no, we're not doing this for this film. Stick to talking about the weak plot and writing, because this shit is a 10 out of 5. Movie tries to out Blues Brothers the Blues Brothers. Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the movie cliche. I'm sorry, I'm running a bit late. I got stuck in some traffic. Bad pun aside, not even five minutes ago you were swinging around New York City literally asking for some crime to stop. So you were late because you were late and an asshole. Not because of this current incident or predicament. See? This is what you should be sinning. Peter starts his nosedive by literally asking what New York has for him today, as if he's just now starting his day seeking crimes to stop. But later we learn he's supposed to be at his high school graduation, which doesn't make any sense when you stop to think about it. This movie is asking us to believe Emma Stone and Andrew Garfield's characters are only just now graduating high school? Do I have to pull up that old video of kids in high school from the 90s again? Don't make me tap the sign. To remind us that... Time is luck. You just told us time is valuable and precious because it ends, but time is also luck? Oh, it's pretty, but doesn't make much sense to me. Time is only what you make of it, and luck will or won't happen depending on how much God hates you. Wouldn't he have to exist for that to make sense? Spidey spins in midair to avoid the bullets, but I don't know why that matters if you're spraying a hail of bullets at one fixed target. Do you think bullets magically track a single target? What do you think this is, a Looney Tunes cartoon? If he's missing his target, which is very easy to do, then he's missing his target. It's made worse that his target has the ability to predict the future and the body and reflexes to act on that future. It makes me not able to live with myself. Peter would rather keep a promise to a dead guy than live his best life with the woman he loves. That's f***ed up. I'm here to tell you, promises to dead people aren't all that important. All right, he's trolling at this point, guys. He's clearly seen fake Birdman's videos and is basically winking at us with that last quip. Dude, are you still f***ing calling me fake Birdman? Look at me, look at me. I'm the Birdman now. Anyway, of course he would attempt to keep the people he loves safe by keeping them at a distance. That's the best way to beat an invincible superhero. Go after the people he loves to break him mentally because it's nearly impossible to do so physically. You know, save Martha and all that jazz. Why did you say that? Also, breaking up in Chinatown. That's racist. Also, also, breaking up in Chinatown was A, the original title of Katy Perry's song Waking Up in Vegas, B, skip. You have done this to me again and again. Peter. Yeah, totally. Like when you were Kirsten Dunst and he was Tobey Maguire. Skip. Not skip. You're doing the thing that No Way Home did when this motherfucker said, I lost Gwen. My, um, she was my MJ. No, Gwen and Mary Jane are two different characters with two wildly different personalities who play different roles in Peter's characterization. The death of Gwen Stacy broke Spider-Man in the comics. Gwen was his true love. Mary Jane came after, and although he did develop intense feelings for her, Pete was never the same after losing Gwen. What I'm saying is, Gwen went splat so that Mary Jane could go missing. Wait. How about that Spider-Man? Last night on the Manhattan Bridge. But why should we see that when he's got a nerd to save from a pack of bullies? Oh man, this is so much better than dating Gwen. So, so much wrong with this film. And you choose to focus on the elements of Spider-Man that this movie absolutely nails. It's almost like you don't know shit about comics or something. It's at times like these that I imagine all the time Spidey doesn't save people who are about to get hit by cars or stop the convenience store robber. These montages always make it seem like he's saving everybody. And how many times does superheroes shop in these places and it just so happens to be the same time he gets robbed? I mean, Jesus. Or they could simply be showing you that he was at the right place at the right time. Of course he can't save everyone. That's not the job. The job is to do what you can when you are able to do something. You know, responsibility. Is it still stalking if it's your girlfriend? Yes. Is it still stalking if the intent is to protect someone? No. F*** you, movie. She doesn't have Spidey sense too, does she? Note to the commenters. Any of you try bringing up Spider-Gwen right now and I will lose my sh I mean, there was an audio cue when he jumped, indicating that he made a whooshing sound. Besides, most of us can tell when someone is watching us. It's called gaze detection, and it's a real phenomenon. Go on, look it up. Give me a second on me, I'll get, I'm gonna get the door. Just give me a second. Just, Peter, just, please just let me in, all right? The classic Aunt May might find out Peter is Spidey thing happens because Aunt May needs something done with her car. She really needs to get in Peter's room to tell him that, doesn't she? It's so very important. And why is he suddenly struggling to take the suit off? Is it stuck? Peter normally wears the costume under his regular clothing, specifically because it's difficult to put on and take off. This is why the MCU went with this abomination. Oh. 
That's why you're here. You remember my birthday. Sometime after Ray, Jamie Foxx started thinking everything he did was rad, and that trend sadly continues to this day. So you're aware this is a resin, right, Jeremy? You know, a video you did 10 years after Screen Junkies did the original video for you guys. And Jamie had many films proving he's one of the most talented men in Hollywood, like Collateral, Django, Soul, and They Clone Tyrone. Speaking of Collateral, Jamie's one of the only actors to receive two Oscar nominations for two different films at the same Academy Awards in the same year he was also nominated for a Grammy. You better put some respect on this man's name. They should call you the Amazing Spider-Man. Roll credits moments aside, this Max has an unhealthy obsession with Spider-Man moment just exacerbates how much time this movie wastes getting to the goddamn story. Spidey took out Russian Paul Giamatti at the beginning, he broke up with Gwen, and it's taking a f***ing lifetime to get to the Electro Park. But see, for better or for worse, this is the story, and frankly it's the part of the plot the film should have spent more time on. The breakup between Pete and Gwen is very rushed given how the previous film ended, and this movie's fatal mistake was shoehorning Green Goblin stuff into this mix when they already had a compelling villain in Electro. This is what the MCU did right, focusing on Spider-Man villains that we hadn't already seen before, like Vulture, Shocker, and Mysterio. That's what made the first Tasm so good. They weren't rehashing what the Sam Raimi films already did, and gave us a cool villain with Lizard. This is my laundry, my home, my machine. Back off. Eat your breakfast. Hold up. Who serves a lettuce on wheat sandwich for f***ing breakfast? I absolutely 1,000 billion percent agree with you. I've also read a lot of comic books, so I can confidently say Spider-Man. Spider-Man seems to like sandwiches for breakfast. Spider-Man saved people from an apartment fire, part 64. I mean, New York is kind of a hotbed for fire-related deaths. No pun intended. Out of all the people in the whole city, he saved me. Yeah, and even let one or two people die in a horrific car accident in order to save you. I'm still shocked about it. Yeah, I got nothing. That was ridiculous. The camera? Sony. The laptop, Sony. The chairs, so well, probably not Sony, but you get my point. Is this your first time watching a Sony movie? Dude, they still put Ericsson's in certain films and would have you believe anyone in America is using an Xperia over an iPhone or a Galaxy. They really should do to Apple what Xbox is doing to them. Concede. Meanwhile, in the underground Oscorp level, entirely devoted to the study of electric eels. Wait, what? As we've been shown in two films at this point, Oscorp derives a lot of their scientific advancements from animals. Hello? That's literally how this Spider-Man got his powers and is the literal overarching plot thread of these two movies. Haven't you noticed a lot of Spider-Man's rogues gallery are animal-based? Rhino? Vulture? Black Cat? Doc Ock? Sandman? No, that's not right. Let's talk about this villain. He gets shocked real bad. So bad, he falls into an electric eel pit. Remember, Oscorp is half aquarium. Gets shocked some more, this time underwater, and that turns him into electricity in liquid and gas form? Shock a guy enough, drop him in water, and he's basically Sandman with water and electricity? This Electro in this specific movie might be the most yada yada villain of all time. I know more about how Pennywise works than this f***ing guy. No, you don't. Besides, man, this is science fiction. How the hell does an irradiated spider give someone the ability to see the future? I feel like if you accept that, electric eels giving someone electric powers isn't that far-fetched. <clears throat> Ten years. It's eight. Chloe, what's up? Hold up, Peter just graduated high school. He's 18. Eight years ago, he was f***ing 10. So is this movie saying this is a supposedly strong friendship and they haven't seen each other since they were f***ing 10 years old? The f at 18, I didn't even remember my friends from fourth grade, let alone feel any kind of attachment to them. Yep, this shit is stupid. Harry and Norman's characters were shoehorned into the plot when they should have been set up in the previous film. This is why this series is so hit and miss. They do some great things, and then they do dumb shit like say these two have had this strong bond since they were 9 or 10 when Harry wasn't even mentioned in the previous film. Give me a break. What the hell is this scene? Peter and Harry left the Oscorp estate, which was established to be somewhere near Central Park earlier. Now they're somewhere near the Manhattan Bridge, which is at least seven miles from that location. Regardless of whether they walked, drove, or took the subway, they've somehow been followed by a surveillance van with Donald Menken in it. Who was at the meeting Harry just left from? How the f*** does Menken coordinate something like that? And how does Peter not have spider sense working? Also, also, if they were just gonna do a harmless outdoor activity while they talked, why the f*** would these two not just walk to Central Park two blocks away and feed the f***ing ducks or something? I like location scouts, but we're either paying them too much or we're not giving them enough information. Again, CinemaSense is cooking. This shit is stupid. Max discovers an insane power, but because the movie refuses to acknowledge him as a human being, we get this creation of a monster scene, complete with the man putting on a hoodie to cover up his appearance. The man talked to himself constantly. Don't we want to hear what he has to say about his newfound situation? Even, uh, it really is my birthday. Would have been fine. Cinnable, but fine. Yeah, but the man is extremely confused and disoriented after having died and come back 
like as Thor. What exactly would you want to hear him say that wasn't displayed through his actions? Oh my god, I'm an electric guy, and I'm blue, when I should be yellow- I'd play the God's Casio keyboard soundtrack music for Electro here, but I'm a little gun-shy about music these days. Point is, what starts out sounding like Electro's theme as a piece of music ends up being presented as some kind of electronic music he himself is producing on purpose by the end of it, and that is whack. Oh there, Nelly. You're again sending the dope things about this movie. The music that Electro produces is not only incredibly clever, it's actually really nice to listen to and fits this world on a thematic level. I'm sad they basically ignored it in No Way Home, outside of a single scene when Electro is first introduced. I really wish these two had made it, and the movie characters too. I agree, because they had amazing chemistry. You what? What is it that you agree with? Frankly, I'm elated they broke up and she shed the innocent girl tag because that meant we got to see Emma fully nude and poor things. Now we're just waiting on Dave McCary to get run over by a car. Bruv, as I was saying, I agree because they had amazing chemistry, but this is still Jeremy Sin something he likes cliche. Every f***ing one of these cars has a car alarm. And? Have you been following me? He has, and yet this is another movie that's going to give me a stalked girl who is charmed by it instead of repulsed. Listen, literally none of the girls I ever stalked were cool with it, but the movie makes it seem all hunky-dory. Well, you know what they say. It's only harassment if you're not attractive. <laughs> How does he know to save this one guy with all the cars going in different directions? Also, you're saying out of all the cars that just got shot into all the different directions, he's the only asshole to nearly get hit by one? I don't understand this question. All those cars got flipped at once, meaning since there's only one Spider-Man, Shut up, nerd Roddick. He can only be one place at a time. I'm assuming his spider sense told him this particular person was in danger, so now we're here with a cool scene that does something the Raimi films forgot to do. Show how strong Spider-Man is. This should be a sin removal. Would someone tell me what kind of a world we live in where a man dressed up as a spider steals all of my press? Earth 120703. Wow, Spidey Sense just went from being a faint clue about imminent events to a full-on Quicksilver once around the scene before I have to act. And that is some f***ing bullshit. No, this is how Spider Sense has always behaved. I've said this before, but it's mainly used for area awareness and alerts Spider Man to what is happening in his general area. This is why it translates into what most people think it does warn him of danger. His body can then react on its own to either get out of the way of danger or do sick shit like this, given the fact that he has super speed. Steals all the electricity, sends out a wave of electricity, which physically destroys buildings and like, I am now starting to understand why and how this movie ended up with nine credited writers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Irony! Visual jokes are fun, but not when they mean Spider-Man took time out of this urgent mission to put on a fireman's hat just for a visual joke. God damn, people are f***ing dying, dude. I don't know if you're aware, but Spider-Man likes to tell jokes. Spider-Man is who MCU Tony Stark thought he was. Dr. Jollings has videos that get into the hundreds of thousands of views, but only two people who subscribe. That f***ing YouTube algorithm, man. I agree, but this is a sin for YouTube's algorithm and not the amazing Spider-Man 2. I need to find him. I need his blood. Why does Harry think that just because Peter took a photograph of Spider-Man that he's in good with Spider-Man? Remember in the previous series when Harry knew this about Peter because he regularly took pictures of him and claimed to know him somewhat. What in this series makes anyone think Peter knows him? The film is assuming you're smart enough to understand Harry isn't just talking about the one photo that happens to be on his desk. I mean, do you think Harry just sits around until the plot needs him to interact with another character? Why wouldn't you assume he's seen multiple newspapers with Peter's name on them? Oh, because the movie didn't spoon feed you that information? Evil Doctor Guy says here in a minute that he's here to study this guy. But how do you know so much about him right off the bat to build this part steel, part water, part electricity prison for him? You remember that one time where you were complaining about Spider-Man and Electro being on the news? Yeah, I think this doctor didn't catch that. He definitely didn't see Spider-Man use water to defeat Electro, even though it was all over the news. Totally missed it. Seriously, why does Peter do this? Can't he just say he can't find Spider-Man? Does he really think Harry's gonna be cool with whatever Spidey says about not giving him blood? That's not the real sin here. The real sin is Peter not even attempting to help Harry at all. I mean, even if he were under the assumption his blood would harm Harry, why not even perform a test? He draws no blood from Harry or performs any science to that end. He just says, nah, and bails on his supposedly best pal that is literally dying. I mean, he never even speaks to Harry again for the rest of the movie up until he becomes the Goblin. Stuff like this is why I consider Tom Holland's Spider-Man to be the best Spider-Man. This Spider-Man is far too cool to be Peter Parker. He's really good with women, he wasn't the one getting bullied by Flash, and he doesn't do science to solve problems. Toby's Spider-Man is far too melodramatic 
dramatic, turning into a quivering, sobbing mess in every other scene, and his quipping isn't as funny as Andrew's. Tom's Spider-Man is the best of both worlds. Nerdy genius that's terrible with women, but funny when he needs to be, and actually does science. The mirror dimension is just geometry? You're great at geometry. You could do geometry. You know what's cooler than magic? <laughs> Math. I mean, you all clown Tom for getting his first suit from Tony, but this Spider-Man had to get his webbing from Oscorp because he doesn't do science. This is the real sin. You're a fraud, Spider-Man! I think we can agree that Harry Osborn and everything about him is one of this movie's biggest issues. I mean, that's truly saying something, because this movie's got issues. As I just said, this is more how they chose to characterize Peter Parker here and less to do with Harry's characterization, which makes sense. If you're being told that Spider-Man helps people and then he refuses to help you, surely this would be upsetting. Maybe Harry is going a bit overboard, but he is dying and his company is doing everything they can to oust him, so he's desperate. The true failing of this film is Peter not using science to help a friend, which is how most Spider-Man conflicts are resolved. This Peter doesn't even attempt to see if their blood is compatible, which could be figured out with a simple blood test. This is weak writing meant to accelerate Harry's descent is what I'm saying. Man, this short-lived franchise sure loved putting Spider-Man in the subways, didn't it? Both the amazing movies have extensive subway exploration sequences. That's weird. No, that's New York. <laughs> you call that a subway? My old lady's been in better subways than that. She should be the friggin' mascot, not that freak. Jerome, Jerry, or Jared, whatever his name is, that freak. This is cool and all, but how did a scientist guy manage to put all this together on his own? This is some bullshit. This took six years, several programmers, a blacksmith, and three dozen different contractors to build, you dicks. Which Richard would have access to, being a high rank at the richest company in the city. Norman Osborn has falsified evidence against me in order to take control of my work. So wait, Norman Osborn knew that Richard was going to betray him, so he falsified evidence against him, which means we are way down the line in the process of a friendship tearing apart and a business partnership being dissolved. And yet Richard still had access to the Oscorp lab to take back all his research without anyone knowing until it was too late? What part of this conversation did you hear that Richard was the one betraying Norman? The full scene states that Norman made a deal with shady foreign agents and Richard refused to continue the work because it would be used for bioweapons. That's not betrayal, that's standing up to power and getting killed for it. He seems really f***ed up. Oh, never mind. He'll be fine. I guess I didn't realize there was an entire protocol dedicated to healing him. Any other protocols I should know about? Training wheels? Ghost? But see, now you're bullshitting. There was an earlier scene where it specifically states that suit heals the user. Next generation military body armor. Features include enhanced mobility, battlefield injury repair, direct nervous system interface. I will control everything and I will be like a god to them. This is the closest Electro gets to explaining his motivations and it's still murky as f No it's not! They spent like 20 minutes showing you that Max was being abused by everyone around him and that he was invisible to everyone. They specifically called him that in the film. No associates or friends to speak of. Guy was invisible. So make sure this Mr. Dillon stays invisible. Then, when he fights Spider-Man for the first time, the movie doubles down on his mental state being affected by how people viewed him. And further still, when Harry rescues him from Ravencroft, he shows that his ultimate want is to be needed. Seriously, Electro is probably the most fleshed out character in the film not named Parker. This fight full of nonsense and obfuscation where no one seems to have any advantage goes on for all the some time. You... You really have a knack for sending the best parts of a film, especially one with so many issues. I would be impressed if I thought this was on purpose. I hate everything about this finale. It's a bunch of audio and video noise. It's somehow a migraine wrapped inside a sleeping pill. And strangely, it's some of the best Spider-Man fight choreography we've ever gotten. Funny that. As Gwen slow motion falls to her death amid falling gears and other- No, we will not be sending this scene today, sir. With all of the whining and melodrama going on in the Raimi trilogy, this scene manages to be the most emotional of any of the pre-MCU movies. If you think anything is wrong with the scene, you just don't have a heart. Whoa, whoa, Spidey, you need to take it easy, eh? What the hell did I just say? And with a cringe pop culture reference, too. Now that Spider-Man's gone, this city will never be the same. Oh, I'm counting on that. These dumbasses assume Spider-Man is completely done rather than simply taking a break to launch this Sinister Six plan. I mean, he's been gone for five months. He was done. He only came back because Aunt Jay is a nag. Peter, where are you going? Gwen is gone. You can't change that. You can't stay sad forever. You're 33 years, I mean, you're 19 years old. See, you thought I made a mistake in the previous sin. Ha ha, I threw that shit before I walked in the room. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Though? Yeah. You got a nice face, you're just a kid. Yeah. You got that suit, 
You help a lot of poor people. I just thought you was gonna be black. Oh man, I'm sorry. <laughs>